My manipulative Mel and Sil turned my husband against me and chose his sister's wedding over our baby's birth. Now I'm divorcing him and his family is furious. I'm Becca, 33 female, and I've been married to Marcus, 35 male, for six years. We have a four-year-old daughter, Mia, and I'm currently eight months pregnant with our second child. I never thought I'd be in this situation, but here I am, anonymously seeking advice from strangers on the internet. Marcus and I met in college. We were both studying business, and we hit it off immediately. He was charming, ambitious, and seemed to have a great relationship with his family. I come from a small family, just my parents and my older sister, so I was drawn to the warmth and liveliness of Marcus's larger family. We dated for three years before getting married. During that time, I got to know Marcus's family well. His parents, Karen, 58 female, and Tom, 60 male, seemed nice enough, if a bit overbearing at times. But it was Marcus's relationship with his younger sister, Jen, 32 female, that really stood out. They were incredibly close, almost like twins despite the age difference. At first, I found their bond endearing. Marcus would always light up when talking about Jen, and she seemed to adore him just as much. During our dating phase, I felt welcomed into their tight-knit group. Family dinners were lively affairs, full of inside jokes and shared memories. I was excited to become part of such a close family. However, after we got married, I started to notice some concerning patterns. Marcus, Karen, and Jen had this exclusive inner circle dynamic that was hard to penetrate. They often huddled together at family gatherings, sharing whispered conversations and giggling about things they wouldn't explain to anyone else. At first, they tried to include me in their conversations, but I quickly realized that much of their bonding revolved around gossiping about other family members or friends. I've never been comfortable with that kind of talk. Growing up, my parents always taught me that if you don't have anything nice to say, don't say anything at all. So, I politely declined their invitations to join their little group. I thought Marcus would appreciate my integrity, but instead, he seemed disappointed that I wasn't fitting in with his family the way he'd hoped. As time went on, I noticed that Karen and Jen weren't particularly warm towards me. They were never outright rude, but there was always an undercurrent of tension. Small comments here and there made me feel like an outsider. For example, they would often reminisce about family vacations or events that happened before I came into the picture, without bothering to fill me in on the context. I tried to maintain a cordial relationship with them, focusing on my own life and my growing family with Marcus. I threw myself into my career as a marketing executive, and for a while, things were manageable, if not ideal. The real issue started when I was pregnant with Mia. My pregnancy was difficult from the start. I had severe morning sickness that lasted well into my second trimester, and at 28 weeks, I was diagnosed with gestational diabetes. My doctor put me on bed rest for the remainder of the pregnancy. During this challenging time, I expected support from Marcus's family, especially since my own family lived several hours away. But to my disappointment, Karen and Jen never visited to check on me. Marcus would spend hours on the phone with them, updating them on my condition, but they couldn't spare a moment to see how I was doing in person. It hurt, but I tried to brush it off, telling myself they were probably just busy. After Mia was born, I noticed some concerning behavior from Karen and Jen. They seemed to view my daughter as a prop, only interested in her when they could show her off to their friends or post pictures on social media. Once, when Mia was about two, I overheard Karen telling her that mommy is not a nice person. I was shocked and confronted Marcus about it. He laughed it off, saying his mother was probably just joking. But I knew better. The look in Karen's eyes when she realized I had overheard was anything but joking. From that day on, I never left Mia alone with them. The situation escalated last year when Jen started dating Richard, 40M, a wealthy businessman from London. Suddenly, the dynamics in Marcus's family changed dramatically. Jen became insufferably boastful, constantly flaunting expensive gifts from Richard. She would show up to family dinners wearing designer clothes and jewelry, making a point to mention how much each item cost. Karen encouraged this behavior, acting like a teenager alongside her daughter. She would giggle and fawn over Jen's stories about Richard's luxurious lifestyle, often making pointed comments about how some people, with a meaningful glance in my direction, could never understand such things. Their newfound status seemed to embolden them. They began making subtle digs at me, implying I was jealous of their lifestyle. Comments like oh, Becca, I'm sure you'd love a bag like this, but they're quite exclusive or it must be nice for you to get out of the house and see how the other half-lives became commonplace. Of course, they never said anything directly insulting to my face, but I could feel the shift in their attitudes. Some relatives even confirmed my suspicions, telling me about the things Karen and Jen were saying behind my back. I was relieved when I got pregnant again, as it gave me a valid reason to avoid family gatherings. The constant stress of dealing with Karen and Jen was taking a toll on my mental health, and I knew it wasn't good for the baby. Marcus would often suggest I let Mia spend time with his family alone, but our daughter always refused. She's only four, but she seems to sense the negativity from her grandmother and aunt. Now, here's where things have taken a turn for the worse. Two days ago, I woke up to find Marcus packing his bags. When I asked him what was going on, he casually informed me that he was flying to London for Jen's wedding. I was stunned. This was the first I'd heard about any wedding plans. I reminded Marcus that I'm due to give birth any day now. My due date is actually next week. His response. It can't be helped. Richard's family insisted on this date. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. My husband was choosing his sister's last-minute wedding over the birth of his child. 
I tried to reason with him, reminding him of the complications I had with Mia's birth and how the doctor had warned us that this delivery might be risky. But Marcus was adamant about going. He said he couldn't miss his only sister's wedding and that I had my parents to help me. He even suggested I could FaceTime him if I went into labor while he was away. I felt betrayed and abandoned. How could he even consider leaving me at such a crucial time? This wasn't just about the birth, it was about the weeks of preparation we were supposed to be doing together, the last moments of calm before our family of three became four. To make matters worse, Karen showed up at our house to pick up Marcus. She had the audacity to smirk at me as she helped Marcus with his luggage. Before leaving, she made a snide comment about how they'd bring back some fancy baby clothes from London. As if designer onesies could make up for Marcus's absence during the birth of his child. I'm writing this post from my bedroom, where I've locked myself away to cry and think. Mia is with my parents, who came over as soon as I called them in tears. They're furious with Marcus and his family, and honestly, so am I. I feel like this might be the last straw in our marriage. Marcus has always prioritized his mother and sister over me, but this takes it to a whole new level. I'm seriously considering divorce, but I'm scared of raising two children on my own. I keep thinking back to all the red flags I ignored over the years. The times Marcus cancelled our plans because Jen needed him for something. The way he always took his mother's side in arguments, even when she was clearly in the wrong. The fact that he never stood up for me when his family made those snide comments. Am I overreacting? Should I give Marcus another chance when he returns? Or is this behavior unforgivable? I could really use some advice right now. I feel lost, hurt, and honestly, a little scared about what the future holds. Update 1. It's been a week since my last post, and a lot has happened. I want to thank everyone for their support and advice. Your words gave me the strength I needed during one of the toughest times of my life. The day after I made my post, I went into labor. It was earlier than expected, and I was home alone. Mia was at my parents' house, and Marcus was still in London. I started feeling contractions in the early afternoon, but at first, I thought they were just Braxton Hicks. By evening, I realized this was the real thing. I managed to call an ambulance, but I was terrified. The thought of giving birth without my husband by my side was overwhelming. The paramedics arrived quickly, and they were incredibly kind. One of them, a woman named Emily, held my hand the whole way to the hospital, assuring me that everything would be okay. I delivered a healthy baby boy, whom I named Oliver. The labor was difficult, it lasted for 18 hours, and there were some scary moments when Oliver's heart rate dropped. But the medical team was amazing, and in the end, both Oliver and I were fine. The hospital staff were incredibly supportive, but they were concerned about my situation. When they couldn't reach Marcus, they contacted the police due to the unusual circumstances. I was embarrassed and upset that it had come to this, but a part of me was glad that someone was taking my situation seriously. My parents and sister arrived at the hospital about six hours after Oliver was born. They had been watching Mia and couldn't find anyone to take care of her on such short notice. When they finally made it to the hospital and learned that Marcus wasn't there, they were livid. My sister, Rachel, 36F, immediately started talking about lawyers and divorce. I didn't hear from Marcus until two days after Oliver's birth. He called from London, sounding panicked. Apparently, he had just checked his phone and seen the missed calls and messages. He claimed he had no idea I had gone into labor and that he would fly back immediately. I was too exhausted and emotional to talk to him, so my father took the call. I could hear him from across the room, his voice rising as he told Marcus exactly what he thought of his actions. My dad has always been a calm, level-headed man, so hearing him so angry was shocking. Marcus arrived at the hospital the next day, full of apologies and excuses. He said his phone had died, and he had been too caught up in the wedding festivities to charge it. He brought a huge bouquet of flowers and a stuffed animal for Oliver, as if that could make up for missing the birth of his son. I couldn't even look at him. The hurt and betrayal were too fresh. My parents and Rachel formed a protective barrier around me and Oliver, barely letting Marcus near us. The nurses, aware of the situation, were also keeping a close eye on things. Marcus begged for forgiveness, saying he had made a terrible mistake. He swore he would make it up to me and that he loved me and our children more than anything. But his words rang hollow. Where was this love when he chose to fly to London despite knowing I could go into labor any day? After being discharged from the hospital, I decided to stay with my parents for a while. I needed time to think and recover without the stress of facing Marcus every day. He's been calling and texting constantly, alternating between apologies and pleas for me to come home. Karen and Jen have also been trying to contact me. They've left voicemails full of half-hearted apologies and thinly veiled accusations. Jen even had the nerve to say that I had ruined her perfect wedding by going into labor. As if I had any control over when my son decided to enter the world. I later found out through mutual friends that Jen's wedding had been a lavish affair, with over 200 guests at a historic castle outside London. Apparently, Marcus had given a heartfelt speech about the bond between siblings, never once mentioning that his wife was due to give birth at any moment. The hypocrisy of it all makes me sick. I'm still processing everything that's happened. The joy of having Oliver is mixed with the pain of Marcus's betrayal. Mia has been asking why daddy isn't with us, and it breaks my heart to see her confusion. I've been trying to explain things in a way that a four-year-old can understand, but it's not easy. I've contacted a lawyer to discuss my options. I'm not sure if I want to go through with a divorce, but I need to be prepared. Marcus's actions have shown me that I can't rely on him when it really matters. 
The lawyer suggested I start documenting everything, Marcus's absence, the calls from his family, everything. She says it could be important if we end up in a custody battle. For now, I'm focusing on bonding with Oliver and helping Mia adjust to being a big sister. My family has been incredibly supportive, and I'm grateful for their help. My mom has taken time off work to help with the kids, and my dad has been running interference with Marcus, fielding his calls and messages so I don't have to deal with him directly. I'll update again when I've made a decision about my marriage. Right now, I'm just taking it one day at a time, trying to heal both physically and emotionally. Thank you all again for your support during this difficult time. Update 2. It's been a month since my last update, and I've made some difficult decisions. I want to thank everyone who has been following my story and offering advice. Your support has meant the world to me during this challenging time. After much soul-searching and several conversations with my lawyer, I've decided to file for divorce. It wasn't an easy decision, but I believe it's the right one for me and my children. In the weeks following Oliver's birth, Marcus's behavior only reinforced my decision. He continued to prioritize his family over us, spending more time trying to smooth things over with Jen and Karen than focusing on his newborn son and daughter. Marcus would come to visit every day, but his visits were more stressful than helpful. He would spend most of the time on the phone with his mother or sister, often stepping out of the room to have hushed conversations. When he was with Oliver, he seemed awkward and unsure, as if he didn't know how to interact with his own son. The final straw came when I discovered that Marcus had been lying about his involvement in Jen's wedding. Through a mutual friend, I learned that Marcus had actually been part of the wedding planning committee. He had known about the wedding date for months but had chosen not to tell me. This revelation shattered any remaining trust I had in him. When confronted, Marcus admitted to the lie. He claimed he didn't tell me because he knew I would be upset about the timing. His admission only proved to me that he valued his sister's happiness over the birth of his child and my well-being. I moved out of our shared home and found a small apartment closer to my parents. It's been an adjustment, but Mia and Oliver are adapting well. Mia sometimes asks about her father, and we've had some difficult conversations, but I'm doing my best to assure her that both her parents love her, even if we're not together. The divorce proceedings have begun, and unsurprisingly, Marcus is not making it easy. He's contesting the custody arrangement, claiming that I'm trying to alienate the children from him and his family. My lawyer assures me that given the circumstances of Oliver's birth, we have a strong case for primary custody. Karen and Jen have shown their true colors throughout this process. They've been spreading rumors among family and friends, painting me as the villain who's tearing the family apart. Some of Marcus's cousins, who I thought were my friends, have stopped speaking to me. It's hurtful, but I'm trying to stay above it all for the sake of my children. On a more positive note, I've started a part-time job working from home, which allows me to care for Oliver and be there for Mia when she's not in preschool. It's challenging juggling everything, but it's also empowering to know that I can provide for my children on my own. I've also started attending a support group for single parents. It's been incredibly helpful to connect with others who understand what I'm going through. Their stories of resilience and success give me hope for the future. As for Marcus, he's still trying to reconcile. He sent flowers, written lengthy emails, and even attempted to enlist my friends to plead his case. But I remain firm in my decision. The trust is broken, and I don't believe it can be repaired. I'll update again when there are significant developments in the divorce proceedings. Thank you all for your continued support and kind words. They mean more than you know. Update 3. It's been six months since my last update, and I'm finally feeling like I'm on stable ground. The divorce was finalized last week, and I wanted to share the outcome with all of you who have been so supportive throughout this journey. The custody battle was tough, but in the end, I was granted primary custody of both Mia and Oliver. Marcus has visitation rights every other weekend and one evening during the week. It's not ideal, but it's what's best for the children right now. Financially, things worked out better than I expected. The judge took into account Marcus's absence during Oliver's birth and his pattern of prioritizing his sister and mother over his immediate family. As a result, I received a favorable settlement, including child support and alimony. This has allowed me to move into a small house with a yard for the kids, which has been great for their well-being. Marcus didn't take the judge's decision well. He accused me of turning the children against him and his family. However, the court-appointed child psychologist report supported my claims about Karen and Jen's negative influence on Mia. The psychologist noted that Mia showed signs of anxiety when discussing her grandmother and aunt, which was a key factor in the custody decision. Speaking of Karen and Jen, they finally backed off, at least publicly. I suspect it has something to do with the fact that Jen's marriage to Richard is on the rocks. Apparently, Richard discovered some financial discrepancies and is considering divorce. The irony isn't lost on me. Jen, who was so quick to judge my marriage and gloat about her perfect relationship, is now facing her own marital problems. As for me, I've thrown myself into building a new life for my children and myself. I've been promoted at work and am now able to work full-time from home. It's challenging, but I'm managing. Mia has started kindergarten and is thriving. Her teacher says she's one of the most empathetic children in the class, always quick to comfort other kids when they're upset. Oliver is growing fast and has started to crawl. He's a happy baby, always smiling and babbling. Co-parenting with Marcus has been interesting. He's trying, I'll give him that. He shows up for his visitations on time and seems to be making an effort to connect with the kids. But there are still moments of tension, especially when it comes to holidays and special events. 
We're working on establishing clear boundaries and communication, but it's a process. I've also started dating again, though very casually. It's strange to be back in the dating world after everything that's happened, but it feels good to be moving forward. I met a nice man, Tom, at a local coffee shop. We've been on a few dates, and while I'm not ready for anything serious, it's nice to have adult conversations that don't revolve around divorce proceedings or childcare. Looking back, I can see how much I've grown through this experience. It was painful and challenging, but I'm stronger for it. I'm no longer the woman who doubted herself or allowed others to dictate her worth. I've learned to stand up for myself and my children, and to trust my instincts. To those who might be in a similar situation, know that there is light at the end of the tunnel. It's not easy, but you're stronger than you think. Don't be afraid to reach out for help, whether it's to friends, family, or professionals. You don't have to go through it alone.